reason the resolution of the slides were yeah. like kind of low sometimes. So I don't know if it was me or. No, it was not just you. We oh, all same. Okay. Yeah. Right. You're blaming the US for this. <laughs> Yeah, I guess. So you really need this infrastructure package. Okay. Cool. All right. So everything going smoothly so far? Yeah, we had a really nice series of morning talks and good. But I'm not sure how, how many people will like instantly come back to this stream. Like they yeah. should know, but I'm not sure they do. Yeah. Ah, okay. Is there like a question session going on there still? Maybe. Yeah. 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 Exactly. I see. Okay. So. Naraji is still talking, but it should be almost over. So. Yeah. Okay. Anyhow, how there is no problem of time because uh, after there is the tutorial. So if uh -huh. we still a bit of time from the tutorial, it's super fine. Okay. Yeah. Well, I I will try not to <laughs> go uh, over time. Now. Because if you if we start later, then of course we finish also later. There is no need sure. to try to compress the talk. Okay. All right. Um, maybe it's also good to say how we're doing questions. So we're doing them through the Q and A. And if you can prefer, we can stop maybe in the middle of your questions or at the end, uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. for you. Um, I mean, I, I think if, if there are questions during the talk, uh, can I, I guess I can just look at the Q and A thing. Yeah, right? exactly. Or if, if it's not too distracting, you can- I will have that directly. open. Now I've got two screens, so I can put that somewhere, I guess. Yeah. Um, I can keep an eye on it, or if I forget to, you can <laughs> yeah. interrupt me. Um, and then, yeah. Participants should be like trickling in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Okay, I think we'll give it another minute for people to trickle in. Yeah. So there's a question, when does the lecture start? Uh, it's scheduled to start now. And uh, since there was a talk before this on a different Zoom link, I guess we're waiting for people to, to switch back to this one before starting.
Yeah, I think um, probably some people are in the Q and A session of the previous talk, so maybe if it's okay with you, we wait one more minute and then get started. Yeah, sure, no problem. Great. All right, well, I think it's uh, about time we can get started. So thanks everyone, welcome back. And uh, it's my privilege to introduce uh, this invited talk from my doctoral advisor, Professor Yuan Chu. She earned her PhD from Harvard where she worked on uh, some quantum optics experiments with nitrogen vacancy centers under the supervision of Misha Lukin. And then afterwards she worked with Rob Sholkoff's group at Yale doing a postdoc uh, they specialize there in superconducting circuit qubits. And at Yale, Yuen achieved a novel result, which is strongly coupling a qubit to a long-lived mode of a mechanical resonator. In 2019, she uh, started her current research group called the Hybrid Quantum Systems Group at ETH Zurich. And with that, uh, you can take it away, Yuen. Great, thanks so much for the introduction, Max. Um, and I just wanna thank all the, the organizers um, for, for the hard work and putting all this together. Um, I think it's really a uh, great service that you've done um, for the community here. Um, so, okay, I guess you guys will be hearing about all kinds of different quantum systems um, that uh, we would like to use um, for quantum computing this, this week. Um, so I will be telling you guys about uh, mechanical uh, oscillators. Uh, and, and how we might be able to, uh, to use those in quantum computing and why we might want to do that. Okay, so just to start us off, right, if you think about the different systems that a quantum computer could be made from, uh, I guess today you heard uh, a few talks about uh, superconducting circuits. Uh, you'll hear about atoms, ions, spin, and, and light. Okay, so there's many different possibilities. So let's take a step back and, and ask what is a classical computer made from? And, and right now you might think, okay, they're made from circuits on a silicon wafer, right? But that wasn't always the case. And even today, uh, if you think about an actual computer, right? There's, there's many different parts to it. So for example, in a cell phone, there are actually mechanical um, systems that filter RF signals. Uh, and uh, you know, a computer isn't very useful unless you can talk to other computers with it. So, um, and nowadays that's, that's done using uh, infrared lights, right? That uh, signal sent over telecom fibers. And so I, I would say that, you know, a, a quantum computer, you can sort of make uh, a similar analogy, right? So, so far we, we don't really know yet what is the, the best system to make it out of. Um, and there probably just, won't just be one, right? Um, and so I think it's just really important to keep in mind that, that we need to keep exploring different types of quantum systems that may have very different properties um, that, that could be useful in, in building a quantum computer. And so in that spirit, um, I will be um, telling you about mechanical objects. Uh, and uh, so maybe two takeaway things from this talk. Right? So one is that uh, I will really be talking about putting the mechanics back in quantum mechanics. So if you recall your first quantum mechanics class, 
right? Um, you know, you talk about these operators, uh, position, momentum, and masses on a spring, and you learn that you can describe that using the quantum harmonic oscillator, which is this, this beautiful problem that you can solve, one of the few examples of that, and you get these equally space energy levels and these A and A dagger operators that create and annihilate excitations. So that's all very nice and, and beautiful, right? But um, I guess I haven't really heard of anyone talking about making a quantum computer, though, out of a mass on a spring. And that's, of course, because in the real world, right, things are much messier. Um, and, and this is a really complicated system. I, I mean, this mass on a spring, right? Um, it's, it's much more complicated than a, a single particular uh, particle moving in a harmonic potential. So, uh, but I will be telling you about how, nevertheless, uh, we will try to control and measure these, um, these uh, macroscopic systems uh, in the quantum regime and, and try and use them for something. Um, and the other uh, uh, idea that I would like you to come away with uh, is that, so you might think, okay, even if we can you know, uh, look at the quantum properties of these, these uh, harmonic oscillators, they are still harmonic oscillators. And, and you learn that, you know, quantum computers are built out of qubits. Um, so how does that work, right? How can you use a harmonic oscillator to encode quantum information and, and process it? Uh, and uh, so toward the end of the talk, I, I will tell you that in fact, you can maybe use a harmonic oscillator for encoding a qubit and it might actually be a pretty good idea. All right, so uh, I'm talking as if, you know, mechanical motion is this thing that is sort of abstract and you learn it in quantum mechanics class, but in the real world, it, it's, it's really hard to work with in the quantum regime, but that's not really true, right? So if you think about simple uh, harmonic oscillator and mechanical systems, right, this mechanical motion has played a big role in lots of quantum systems that are used in, in quantum information so far. So for example, in trapped ions, right, you have to take into account or maybe make use of the motion of these particles inside uh, the, the trap, which is a, a harmonic potential. So here's, for example, um, a, 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 a two qubit gate proposed by Momo and Sorensen that takes into account that uh, you know, even though you, these particles might be moving around in this potential because of thermal motion, you would still like to be able to perform these gates. And they came up with a way to do that. OK, but in this talk, I'm, I'm talking about a slightly different regime, which is I'm talking about mechanical uh, vibrations inside a solid state object. So these are not the motion of a couple of atoms. These are, this is the most collective motion of a very large number of atoms, right? And as you can imagine, things get a little bit more complicated, but also a little bit more interesting, right? Um, and here I'm just showing some pictures of, you know, different types of uh, objects that can exhibit this motion. These can be guitar strings or drum heads uh, or just sound waves propagating in a crystal, okay? Um, all right. so. Why is, is this challenging really, right? So, I mean, as I said, this is a complex system it has many atoms and why, you know, does that make it harder? Well, a, a system that is made up of many composite parts, of course, has more degrees of freedom, right? And, and, and you have to be able to, um, you know, deal with all those degrees of freedom and control them um, and perhaps isolate one that you would like to work with. Uh, of course, then that also means there's more potential for defects and protections in your system. Uh, Mechanical systems also couple to basically everything. Um, so electromagnetic waves, uh, spins, uh, gravitational waves, as you might have heard. Um, and, and so that makes things more complicated, of course, also because one of the um, important uh, aspects of building a, a quantum system is uh, that we can control is, is to isolate it from, from the environment. Okay. Uh, and then finally, as I mentioned before, it's, it's a harmonic oscillator, right? So, um, but I would say that it is uh, interesting for the same reasons, right? If you think about what we're trying to do when we build a quantum computer, we're basically taking quantum systems, putting them together and making a more, more and more complicated system, right? Whether you do that using individual atoms or, um, or drawing more and more complicated circuits, or you take a system that is intrinsically more complex, um, there's a sort of idea of how, how complex of a system can we make and still control it quantum mechanically? Okay. Of course, this, this 
uh, property that the mechanical resonators coupled to almost everything can also be very useful. Right? We can imagine using it to, for example, transfer information between different quantum systems uh, and link them up. Uh, and then finally, as, as I mentioned, um, I will hopefully be able to convince you that the fact that it's a harmonic oscillator uh, actually makes them uh, interesting and, and potentially very useful for encoding quantum information. Okay. So, um, so what are some of the things that you might want to consider if you want to make a mechanical uh, object and operate it in the quantum regime and, and use it for quantum computing, let's say? Okay, well, so one important uh, unique property of mechanical systems is, is that they're highly engineerable, right? Uh, in the sense that it's much more so than a lot of other quantum systems, right? If someone gives you an atom, that's, that's what it is. Uh, but a mechanical system you design and you can make it and, and you have a bunch of choices to make. For example, what frequency should it have? Uh, how big should it be? What, what, you know, what shape should it be? What material even should it be made out of, right? Um, but uh, let's say with, with great power comes great responsibility. So you have to be careful when you answer these questions and really think about um, how do we make a system such that we can really operate it in the quantum regime. Okay, so let's start with one of these questions, one of the simple ones, which is uh, what frequency should it have? And maybe relatedly, how big should it be? All right. Um, and, uh, and so here on the bottom, I've drawn a sort of a scale of frequencies and corresponding temperatures and also some cryogenic systems that you might use to reach those temperatures. And one important thing to realize here is that the speed of sound is much, much smaller than the speed of light. It's about 10 to the four times smaller. Okay, and, and to drive this point home, uh, let me just compare two systems. So on the right is an optical cavity that confines infrared light, which has a wavelength of about a micron, right? And there, the, the frequency that that corresponds to is about 100 terahertz, all right? Now, if you take something that looks very similar, it's a, a, a cavity for sound. It's just a piece of material and, and sound out, but now you can find sound waves inside of it, and it has the same wavelength of about a micron. Now, these sound waves are going to have a frequency on the order of a few gigahertz instead. Right? Again, just because the speed of sound is so much slower. Now, of course, there are other ways you can confine sound. You can make a periodic structure called a phononic crystal. Again, this is very analogous to a photonic crystal. But now, if you make these, these features on the order of a micron in size, you're going to confine modes that also have about a, a gigahertz in frequency. And if you make these features bigger, you are going to correspondingly scale down the frequency. Right. But and, and people do this and even down to, you know, the, the kilohertz uh, range for for these mechanical resonators. And, and so this orders of magnitude range that you can choose from for making your systems is, is nice for, in some cases, but you have to be a bit careful. Right. So if you make a mechanical resonator that has very low frequencies, of course, you might end up in a situation where your energy scale H bar omega is much less than KVT. Right? Which means that even if you put it in a dilution refrigerator, let's say, your mechanical system might not be in the quantum ground state. And now you might wonder whether or not the quantum ground state is a necessary thing to have. Well, it turns out that that's not always the case, depending on what you want to do. But usually that's a nice place to start. Right? And, and so if you want to reach that for these low frequencies, you have to um, be able to cool your system. Um, through some other means. And I will not talk about that in this talk. And there, there's a lot of work that has gone into this and, and people can in fact do that. They can cool even these megahertz frequency resonators, for example, into, into the ground state. Okay. All right. So that's, that's one basic thing out of the way. Another basic question that I alluded to was what even makes a mechanical resonator quantum or for that matter, what makes any harmonic oscillator quantum, right? So you might remember uh, from your quantum mechanics class that a harmonic oscillator has a states that correspond, uh, that have a, a classical analogy, right? Um, that correspond to a classical state and those are coherent states, right? So a, a two level system, a qubit doesn't have states that have, that have any classical correspondence, but that's not true for a harmonic oscillator. Okay, so um, when we're talking about these harmonic oscillators, we have to be careful about how do we define uh, when it's, it is in a quantum state? Um, and this is actually not a very easy question to answer. There, there are different ways of answering it. Um, the way that I will answer it is, is one that is maybe most relevant to, to the context of the summer school, uh, which is, you know, 
you can ask the question of if you have a system of harmonic oscillators, can it be efficiently simulated by a classical computer? And it turns out this is a question that people uh, uh, figured out, or at least some conditions under which this will be the case. Right? So if you satisfy the following conditions, right, um, that means your system can be efficiently simulated. But it does not mean that if you don't follow those conditions, it can't be efficiently simulated, right? The converse doesn't hold. But so here are some conditions. So first, if you start in a Gaussian state, and what is a Gaussian state? A Gaussian state is a product of coherent states and squeezed states, okay? All right, so if you start there and you perform operations on your system that are called linear operations, which is kind of a confusing name because they are either first or second order in the position and momentum. Um, all right, so here's some, some examples here. Equivalently, you can write it in terms of creation and annihilation operators. Okay, uh, and then uh, if you do a linear measurement, which is some combination, some linear combination of position and momentum, right, which is also called a quadrature measurement. And then finally, if you feed back on those measurements, right? So if you only do these things, your system of harmonic oscillators can be efficiently simulated by a classical computer. Now, of course, the point of having a quantum computer is to do something that a classical computer can't do. So uh, the idea is you want to find some way of breaking out of the confines of, of these conditions, right? And, and the, the clue here is that somehow nonlinearity is an important ingredient um, in, in making a useful quantum system out of harmonic oscillators. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, let's first look at two examples of how do we even control and measure um, mechanical oscillators in the first place, right? Uh, we, we don't really have like a quantum microphone that we can just like listen to vibrations with. Uh, most of our measurement and control devices in the quantum world are electromagnetic in nature. And so here's two examples that interface mechanical resonators with um, an electromagnetic system. So um, the first is something called optomechanics, which is a huge field that many people are working on. Um, it's the principle behind LIGO, the gravitational wave detector, for example. And the idea is the following. So again, you have your mass on the spring, except now that mass happens to be a mirror uh, that is one of two mirrors that make up a cavity for light, for um, photons. And let's say there are some number of photons inside the system uh, and, and you know, they leak out a little bit and you can measure that on some sort of detector. Okay, so um, the way that the system can be described is using the following Hamiltonian. This is called the optomechanical Hamiltonian. And the idea is the following, right? So the frequency of this optical cavity basically will depend on the distance between these mirrors, right? And that, of course, then depends on the position x of this mechanical object. And that's why it is, def it is um, described by this Hamiltonian, which is proportional to a dagger a times um, the position. So A dagger A here describes is the, uh, so A here is the operator for uh, the, the annihilation operator for the photons inside the optical, um, inside the electromagnetic cavity. And of course, you can rewrite this in terms of um, the uh, creation annihilation operators for your mechanical resonator as well. Okay, so this is a very interesting Hamiltonian and, and you can observe all kinds of interesting phenomena using it, but I'm not going to talk about them. Instead, I will just point out that this is a nonlinear Hamiltonian. Notice that it is third order in the operators. Okay, so that's great. Uh, I guess, you know, you might say, okay, so, so we've broken one of the conditions on the previous slide. But in reality, this G naught, this coupling strength between these two systems is usually very small. In fact, it is much, much smaller usually than the rate at which energy is lost from the system. So even though in principle, this Hamiltonian can lead to quantum effects, um, there's not usually not enough time to see them essentially, right? And so instead what people do is they put a bunch of photons into the optical, um, into the, the electromagnetic resonator. And then what you can do is effectively you can replace your, your uh, annihilation operator essentially by some coherent amplitude, in this case, proportional to the square root of the number of photons. And then what you get is a enhanced interaction strength, which is shown down here. So G naught times the square root of the number of photons but you pay the price that now your Hamiltonian is a bilinear interaction, right? Which, is, which does not break the condition um, on the previous slide. Okay, so what do you do? Well, there is another ingredient to this, which is the measurement. And as we said before, if you do um, quadrature measurements, for example, of position and momentum, let's say using heterodyne detection or homodyne detection, 
uh, you cannot you know, break these conditions. Um, you will get still have a system that can be classically simulated. Um, however, you can do other types of measurements. You can, for example, count photons. Um, and that is nonlinear measurement, right? You are measuring the, uh, the energy uh, and not the amplitude of your field. Okay, and, and by doing this, you can, in fact, create a non-classical state. So there were, as an example, there were these two recent works uh, that show that you can um, subtract or add a single phonon from a, a thermal state, so a classical state of a harmonic oscillator. Um, and basically the idea here is that even if you only have this bilinear interaction that I showed you on the previous slide, uh, in some regimes, you can think of that interaction as basically um, allowing the the phonons and the photons to swap with each other, right? And so by sort of looking at uh, whether or not you got a photon out that you get some information about how many phonons there are in the system. And so you basically um, are, are able uh, to, uh, to get this, this information about the quantum state uh, of, your, of your mechanical resonator and to control it. Okay. So um, that's one example. Um, the second example, the second sort of paradigm for, for quantum acoustics that I want to talk to you about is something called circuit quantum uh, acoustodynamics, uh, which is uh, so named because in, in analogy to circuit quantum electrodynamics, which I guess you heard about this morning, um, and it has some of the same ingredients. So one ingredient uh, is a superconducting circuit, and in this case, a superconducting qubit. And this is an important ingredient because this immediately breaks uh, the assumptions that we made uh, two slides ago, right? A superconducting qubit is not a harmonic oscillator. It is an anharmonic oscillator because it has this uh, Josephson junction, which makes it, which has, is a nonlinear inductor. So I am assuming that you guys heard about this this morning, so I'm not going to go into all the details here, but that's basically the idea, right? We're right off the bat introducing something that breaks the assumptions that we had to in the, the previous slides. Okay, but then the other part of the circuit is a capacitor, which has an electric field. And what we're going to do is we're going to put our, our acoustic uh, uh, resonator, um, our mechanical system, and a piezoelectric material inside this electric field. And an electric, um, a, a piezoelectric material basically converts uh, uh, electromagnetic energy into acoustic energy, right? So to be a bit more quantitative, the way this works is that the energy of this interaction is, uh, depends basically on the strain of your, of your mechanical mode, the electric field from your, your qubit or your circuit in general, and the piezoelectric tensor of this material. Okay, you can rewrite this in, in terms of your quantum operators. And, um, and essentially, in some regime, you can, you can see that you get a Hamiltonian that has, again, some coupling strength and allows you to essentially exchange excitations or quanta between your mechanical object and, uh, and your qubit. Okay, so uh, turns out this is piezoelectricity is one way to do this or other ways of, of coupling these kinds of systems. And, and there's just uh, an example there at the bottom. Okay, so another thing that we haven't mentioned about you know, controlling these systems in the quantum regime, we said you have to somehow break out of these, these uh, restrictions um, that I showed you two slides ago. Um, but the other thing, right, those, those conditions don't say anything about losses or noise. Um, of course, if you have too much noise or loss in your system, you can also destroy your quantum mechanical properties. And so another important thing to talk about is uh, how do we isolate mechanical objects from the environment? Okay, so to do that, I will make an analogy to between uh, acoustic waves and light, in this case, microwaves. Okay, so on the left here is just a piece of crystal. On the right is a um, a metallic box made out of superconducting aluminum that we have in our lab. So this is, sorry, this is half of a box. Um, there's another half that looks the same. Um, and together they make a, a, a basically a hole inside a piece of aluminum. Okay, and microwaves live inside this hole, which is vacuum, which is a really, really low loss, really nice uh, material for, uh, for electromagnetic waves to travel in. A perfect crystal is also a very low loss medium for acoustic waves, uh, but it turns out even a perfect crystal is not perfectly lossless. Um, so the other important ingredient here that you might notice is that uh, the boundaries of these objects are, are in principle perfect mirrors, right? So acoustic waves can't travel in vacuum, so they get to just the end of an object and they reflect off of it. 
Um, same with microwaves, right? Um, they basically are confined by these um, by the superconducting material. But um, of course, the story is not that simple. If you really zoom in and look at these surfaces, they are they are not um, they're no longer perfect crystals or perfect superconductors. You have defects. You have um, other materials on the surface, uh, maybe some oxides or amorphous materials or some junk that got left over during the fabrication. Um, so surfaces are, are messy and that's actually, you know, the thing that actually limits a lot of um, these systems, both in the mechanical systems and, uh, and electromagnetic systems. So there's another source of loss, which you might think is, is sort of unique to mechanical objects, which is that uh, Acoustic waves or mechanical vibrations have to live inside a, a you know, a, a material object and, and those have to be supported somehow. Uh, and, and acoustic waves can also travel in the supports. And so, um, and this is in, uh, called clamping losses where you can lose energy through the supports of your mechanical resonator. But there are ways to deal with this. Um, you can just levitate your entire mechanical object. So here is a picture of a levitated uh, dielectric particle, um, so now it's supported by light actually rather than another physical material. Um, as I mentioned before, you can also confine acoustic waves to part of a material uh, by shaping it, right? And actually here there is an analogy to electromagnetic waves, right? I mean electromagnetic waves can propagate in all of free space, but we design optics in order to confine them to some region of space, right? And then in this case, for example, right, you don't really care if, if um, the material is, say, touching some other lossy um, objects where your, your acoustic waves are not living. So, um, so there are all these, these different considerations um, when you want to isolate your mechanical objects from uh, the environment. And now the question is, does this work? Uh, it turns out that this works amazingly well. Um, so here are some examples of mechanical resonators with different frequencies having very long lifetimes, right? On the order of many, many seconds. And, and this is of course comparable to some of the, the most coherent quantum systems out there. So one caveat uh, uh, is that these systems were measured uh, in the classical regime. But uh, we have shown that actually, even uh, in the system where you can measure the quantum properties of, of uh, mechanical uh, objects, uh, you have lifetimes that are much shorter. And of course, you know, when you put different objects together in order to, to do these uh, quantum operations and measurements, um, things tend to get a little bit more complicated and it's, it's harder to maintain the pristine properties of just an isolated mechanical object, right? Uh, however, um, these lifetimes uh, are still long enough for us to, uh, to perform quantum operations uh, on these systems. And so now I'll, I'll tell you about how that works. Okay, so let's start with the simplest quantum operation you could probably think of with the system. All right, so we're going to take the example of circuit uh, quantum acoustic dynamics, circuit Q80 again. So here we have a qubit. And we have our harmonic oscillator, which are, uh, have these energy levels or different numbers of phonons. Uh, and if you remember, we have this interaction that can exchange energy between them. Okay, so now what you can do, right, is you can put uh, a quantum of energy into your qubit. And that's the important thing about having this nonlinear system is you can put a single quantum of energy in, right, which you can't do that in a harmonic oscillator if you just have a classical drive. Okay, so now what's going to happen is that this energy will swap into the phonon because of the, the interaction. Uh, and now what you've done is you've created a state of one phonon. This is the Fox state one of a mechanical oscillator. And if you let this keep continue, it will swap the energy back into the qubit and eventually it will decay through some other decay channel. Okay, and, and this is what we see when we measure this in, in the lab. These are called vacuum Rabi oscillations. You see that this swapping happens um, when these two systems uh, are basically resonant with each other. Okay, so these are just um, some, uh, an example of some of the parameters of such a system, right? And the important thing to realize here uh, uh, is that if you compare the coupling strength to the loss rates of both the qubit and the mechanical resonator, we have that the coupling strength is much, much bigger than both loss rates. And that's important for seeing this phenomenon, just because you have to have enough time for this um, energy exchange to happen before all of the energy leaks out. Okay, so 
this is sort of the simplest thing you can think of doing with this system, but you don't have to stop there, right? Um, you can think about making some more complicated quantum states. For example, what if you, so what I've shown you is you excite the qubits, you let the energy move over into the mechanical resonator. What if you excite it again, and again, let the energy move over into the mechanical resonator, right? And, and that works, you just have to be a little bit careful because the rate at which this, this um, swapping back and forth happens, that scales with the square root of the number of excitations in your system. If you just look at the Hamiltonian, you'll see that that is the case. Um, and but that's okay. You can you just control how long you turn on this interaction for, and you can continue this process all the way up this ladder of phonon states. And, and let's say, okay, let's say we stop when we have three phonons in the system. And now how do we know that we have three phonons? Well, you can, again, use the fact that the rate at which this sloshing back and forth of the energy scales with the square root of the number of phonons in your system or the number of excitations in general, right? And, and use that to basically count how many phonons are in the system. And, and this is what I mean. So this is a plot of some experimental data where we see that as we climb up the number of um, uh, uh, phonons in our system, we see that the oscillations of the energy swapping back and forth get faster and faster. Okay, but if we, if we look carefully, right, there's more than one frequency component in these oscillations, as it turns out. Uh, and that's an indication that we don't have all of our population in the state with of three phonons. Maybe there's a little bit in two and three and, and four, and we can actually use the different frequency components to analyze this data to figure out how much population is in each FOX state. Um, and so we can do that. And so you see here, for example, when you make a state with three phonons, most of it ends up in the state with three phonons, uh, but there's some stuff everywhere else, okay? Um, so this tells us something about our, our mechanical system, and, and these are distinctly quantum states, um, if, if this, but this is not the whole story, right? Uh, what we've measured here are just the populations in our states, right? We, this could still just be a statistical mixture. Uh, essentially, we've only measured the diagonal elements of our ma density matrix. Now, to fully characterize the quantum state that we have created, uh, we need to do something called quantum tomography. Uh, and this is, of course, an important tool in, in, in many quantum information systems. But for a harmonic oscillator, there are some particular techniques for doing this. And I will just quickly talk about one particular technique that we use called Wigner tomography. Okay, so the, the way this works is it's actually pretty simple. I will just um, explain it to you real quick. So let's take one of these histograms, right, um, that tells us where the populations are. And then we're going to calculate something called a parity, which is just the sum of all the populations in the even number uh, Fox states minus the sum of all the populations in the odd number of Fox states. Okay. So here, for example, if you calculated the parity, you would get some large negative number because most of the population is in the state one. Okay, and then you take your phase space. So phase space is basically on the x-axis, you plot the, the x component, and on the y-axis, you plot the, the y component. Uh, sorry, the, sorry the, on the x-axis, you plot the uh, position, and on the y-axis, you plot the momentum right, of your harmonic oscillator, right? Or you can think of it as the real and imaginary parts of the complex amplitude of your oscillations. And you take this parity and you plot it as some color on this color scale in the middle. Okay, so here it's blue because it's negative. Okay, so this is what we've done. Uh, we've made the state and we measure the parity and we put it at the center of phase space. Now, what we can do is in between these two things, we can do a displacement of our harmonic oscillator. And the displacement here, by, uh, by that I just mean a coherent classical drive of the harmonic oscillator with some, some amplitude and phase given by this complex number alpha, right? And that corresponds to some location in phase space. And now we're going to take the result of this measurement and we're going to plot that in phase space. All right, we can do this for many different uh, displacements, many different alphas. Okay, and what this does is it maps out something, oops, sorry, um, something called the, uh, the Wigner quasi probability distribution, which is defined down here, which is just this equation is just showing exactly the process I just described. Okay, and what this is, is a picture in phase space of your quantum state that contains all the information about your quantum state. Okay, you can think of it as, as a visual representation of the, the quantum state of harmonic oscillator. 
And so what that looks like is, for example, when you have one excitation in your harmonic oscillator, this is what this picture looks like, the, the Wigner distribution of the Fox state one. Uh, and we can measure something that looks quite similar in the lab. Uh, this is uh, what we measure when we have one phonon in our mechanical resonator. Okay, and uh, we can do the same thing for some other states, like a superposition of vacuum and one phonon. We can do it for two phonons. Um, maybe it's more intuitive for you to think about the, the density matrix. Uh, but like I said, the Wigner distribution contains all the information about your quantum state. So if you'd like, you can reconstruct your quantum state and reconstruct your density matrix and, and plot that instead. So for example, you see here, right, for the one state, most of your population is a one. Uh, for the superposition, you have these off diagonal elements showing the, you the coherence. Um, okay, so that's, that's all well and good. We've shown that we've, we can actually make quantum states in our mechanical object and we can, um, and we can characterize them fully. But let's return to the question of what is this good for, right? We have this harmonic oscillator and what if we, how do we encode quantum information and how do we encode a qubit? Well, you can say, okay, I'm just gonna choose two levels of this harmonic oscillator. I'm gonna choose zero and one, the two lowest energy levels. I'm gonna call that a qubit, right? Uh, you can do that. And, and you know, we've shown we can make those states, we can make superpositions of them. But now you might wonder, okay, so, but there's all these other states in our, in our Hilbert space, our Hilbert space is infinite and we're just using two out of the, the infinite number of states. Is there something that, you, that useful that we can do with all of these other states, right? Um, and the question, uh, the answer to this question, we think is yes. Um, so let me give you an example. Okay, so remember the, um, the coherent state, right? It's this classical state which is actually a superposition of all of the different uh, Fox states, the, the energy eigenstates of the harmonic oscillator. So here we're really, this really makes use of the full um, Hilbert space. And what I've drawn here are the, uh, the Wigner distributions of two coherent states, one with the complex amplitude equals to one and one with it equals to minus one. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna call those the zero and one of a qubit. So not necessarily plus and minus one, but plus and minus some uh, quantity alpha. Okay, so here it is, there's a block sphere. Here is our zero and one states along the Z axis, right? And it's plus and minus some coherent, uh, some coherent states with opposite phase basically. Okay, and let we can continue with this idea, right? We can define the other states of our qubit so for example, the, the X eigenstates are actually superpositions of these coherent states. And these are called Schrodinger cat states because this is exactly the idea of the Schrodinger cat. This is a quantum superposition of two classical states, right? Um, and you know, this defines a perfectly good qubit. Okay, but now you might ask, but, but why, right? So why would we wanna do this? Well, so I'm gonna give you just a very small, super oversimplified hint of this. If you consider the dominant loss mechanism in a harmonic oscillator, it's usually you just lose energy from it, right? Like photons or phonons just leak out. Um, and that's represented by this, this, this nihilation operator A. And now if you act that operator on the state one, the Fox state one, you get zero. And so the information is just lost, right? So you can't tell if you started in one or zero. If you act it on a, on a coherent state, however, a coherent state is an eigenstate of the phonon loss operator. And, and so you get the same state back. And so in some sense, information is protected. Okay, so this is a super simplified picture. The full, the full story is of course much more complicated. Um, and for that, you can stay tuned for Shruti Puri's lecture on, on Thursday and, and she will tell you about exactly how this works. Okay, but I hope this gives you an idea of why it might be a good idea to encode a qubit, um, actually not in the two level system, or the Fox states, but inside some more complicated state of our harmonic oscillator. Okay, so, um, uh, and people have done this and, and show that it works inside microwave resonators and circuit QED. Uh, so now you might wonder, can we do this in mechanical resonators? Uh, well, so here's just a table that compares some of the, the properties of circuit QED and circuit QAD systems. And what you might notice here, right, this third column here is the coupling strength, and the first two are the, the, the loss rates of these systems. Uh, 
And you see that, relatively speaking, the coupling strength of circuit QAD systems are still much lower compared to the loss rates than, than in circuit QED systems. Oops, sorry. Um, and of course, this makes it a bit harder to do all of these quantum operations that are necessary to prepare and control and measure these states. So right now, um, our, our goal in this field is to get to the parameter regime, for example, of circuit QED, uh, or even better, where uh, we can perform uh, same, the same kind of operations. But now you might wonder, okay, well, that sounds like some quite a bit of work and it sounds like it's harder. So why would we do this in a mechanical oscillator uh, and not just do it in, in microwave oscillators, which seem to work so well. Um, and uh, so, um, well, there are some reasons for this, right? And, and we've actually already touched upon them. So one of them is that mechanical modes are much smaller than electromagnetic modes at the same frequency. So they are more compact and they also have um, better crosstalk properties. Uh, we also said they have different decoherence mechanisms and maybe in some cases they can actually, uh, in the end, be more coherent. And then finally, um, they couple to other systems, right? So they can be a, an, an integral component of linking together different parts, let's say, of a quantum computer. Okay, so based on all of these unique systems, right, uh, I'm, I'm basically, I've been telling you about how perhaps we can use mechanical oscillators in order to uh, encode quantum information and use it for quantum computing, and maybe also use it to link up different parts of, of, of a quantum information device. Uh, I didn't talk about this at all, but of course, the other unique thing about mechanical oscillators is that they are mechanical, and so they're sensitive to things like forces and uh, gravitational waves, um, which other quantum systems might not be. Um, and uh, so they might be useful also as quantum sensors. Okay, so to summarize, I would say that, that sort of the, the opportunities and challenges for, um, for quantum acoustics right now uh, in the context of, of using these systems for, for quantum information is that we have these unique quantum properties, but we need to, to uh, figure out how to really maintain and utilize them in a hybrid system, which we need to make in order to really control and, and measure them, right? But fortunately, they, they do talk to many different other types of quantum objects. Um, but we still need to get to the regime um, of parameters that allows us to build really useful quantum devices. Okay, so um, that's uh, basically the end. I'll leave you with this picture of some people who are working on doing exactly that. Uh, this is my group uh, over Zoom. Um, and then also uh, some of our collaborators that, that we are working with on various uh, theory topics and experimental um, efforts. Okay, so um, that's it from me and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, I see we already have two. Should I just go ahead and answer them? Yeah. Okay, so I asked how, uh, how big qubit systems have been created so far with the acoustic mechanical approach. Okay, so the answer to that question um, is maybe a bit more nuanced and, and subtle, right? So the point of having, of encoding information in this uh, harmonic oscillator, let me just go back to here, is th the idea is that we want to use this one harmonic oscillator, this one mechanical oscillator to take the place of many qubits, right? That's sort of the idea, right, behind if you think about, okay, why do you want so many qubits? Well, one reason maybe is that you want to be able to do error correction for which you need redundancy, um, which uh, I guess will be discussed later in the week, right? And uh, in the end, at the heart of error correction is the idea that if you encode information, not in a two level system, as I've described here, right? If you encode information in a two level system, it's very easily lost. If instead you expand your Hilbert space, and encode your information as sort of delocalized over many different qubits, which is you know, one reason why you might want to have many qubits, um, you can somehow protect that information. And here it's the same idea, right? You already have an infinite Hopper space, which is like having many, many qubits in some sense, right? But now you have only one physical system. And so, so this might be, you know, sort of a clever way of rather than making a whole bunch of qubits and connecting them together, making one system um, that can perform the job of many qubits. Okay. Um, all right. So the next question uh, is, what is the physical footprint of these crystals? Is it like the 3D metal cavity? Right. So one thing I hinted at the beginning is that in addition uh, to there being a whole range of frequencies, there's also a whole range of, of sizes of uh, these, these systems. Um, right, so these, for example, the phononic 
uh, crystals that I talked about. Um, I guess uh, maybe I can just uh, go back and show you. Uh, essentially, so those are those have features that are on the uh, the wavelength scale. So, for example, if you're talking about gigahertz mechanical resonators, they have they're you know on the order of, of microns uh, size. You can make uh, these these bulk acoustic wave cavities, right, which confine just sound waves inside a crystal. Those can be quite a bit larger. Um, and, uh, you know, they, there's a whole range of them, right? Uh, so, yes, so I mean, in the end, you know, some of them might be like the size of the 3D metal cavities, some of them might be um, much smaller, but if you talk about the footprint of the eventual device, you probably, you know, package it all in, in a box and, and they all end up being sort of the same size. <laughs> Okay, uh, we have a question. Are they transverse or longitudinal um, acoustic modes? Yeah, so that's the other thing, right? So again, there's, you, you have flexibility to choose. Um, so uh, you can have modes of different polarizations depending on how you design your structure. Um, so for example, right now in the, in the devices that we use, we mostly use longitudinal waves inside, uh, inside a crystal. Um, but uh, actually that does not have to be the case. Uh, we also thought about um, looking at uh, transversely polarized um, uh, mechanical modes. And uh, of course, I, I mean, in these other structures, it's a little bit more complicated to, to define what that means, right? Some of these materials are, are even 1D or, or 2D, so yeah. Awesome. Um... Seems like we got some good questions and we're a few minutes over the scheduled time. So I guess we will leave it there. And thank you again, Ewan, for the wonderful talk. Yeah, um, thank you. I, yeah. <laughs> and for everyone else in the, the conference, for those of you who are uh, able to participate in the Kiskit uh, hands-on coding session, that will be starting uh, in 10 minutes in Gather and all of the information for how to join, you can find in the, uh, for, for how to join the Gather space, you can find that in the leaflet. For how to join the, the Kiskit session, you can find that in the email you were sent yesterday. And uh, with that, I will uh, see you all there.